On this week's episode of Matchpoint Canada, we're thrilled to welcome one of the best Canadian tennis players of all time. He's an eight-time titleist on the ATP circuit, former world number three, a four-time Masters 1000 finalist. He's also the first Canadian man to reach the Australian Open semis, French Open quarters, and Wimbledon final in the Open era. Pleased to welcome Milos Raonic back on the podcast. Milos, so great to see you. It's good to be back. Like we were just saying before, uh, a little overdue, but uh, better late than ever. You were just saying how much you missed the media over the past two years, so we're <laughs> we're well, so happy media. to have you. Here. Honestly, I uh, it wasn't the media questions of it; it was just general questions because right. obviously, so much of it was, you know, a lot of things would be changing day to day with injuries. Things are going well for a little bit, then they're not, and all this kind of stuff. So, just general questions of like, hey what's going on this kind of, that was like more uh more of it than anything and obviously that gets amplified when it comes to a question of media i'll bet you i mean like ben and i have received so many questions the past couple of years from people just even in passing hey what's going on with milos as if we have that insider knowledge and look i respect the fact that we've touched base a few times over that time and, and you request a little bit of privacy not knowing exactly when you'd be able to come back but we're thrilled to have you on today because now we can finally put you on the hot seat and get the answer to those questions and share them with our listeners who've been very excited to see you back on tour. So, you know, for starters, can you give us the abbreviated version of what two years away from competitive tennis has looked like for you? Yeah, um, it's really um, a life that I was not very familiar with, right? I've, I've been away from tennis for short periods of time. And this kind of thing due to injuries. But even when you're at those moments, when you're away from tennis, you have such an immediate urgency to get back that you never really get away from it. You just get away from playing competitive tennis matches, but you're still always able to practice. You're still able to do something day in and day out where you feel like you're making progress, where you feel like you're improving, where you feel like you're getting closer to your goals and the things you wish and hope to achieve. Um, Whereas this, you know, especially the first, probably 14 months of that was quite different in the sense of um, struggling with an Achilles issue. And um, it wasn't even a question of what I could do. It's um, I was having trouble just even like bouncing in the middle of a tennis court to be able to like get into a split step. Like once it was hurting at that, then I was like, okay, I need to take more steps kind of back with my expectations and with how long it's going to take to heal and so forth. And that was about 14 months of not really hitting a tennis ball minus like a few times where you just step out until you kind of, you know, you're like, Oh, this feels fine. I feel good. You wake up the next day, you're hurting there. And you're like, okay, I'm not at that point yet. So I think once I had the sense of it was going to be a longer period of time, there isn't a question of like ranking anymore. There isn't a question of gaps in like, will I defend this or not? Once that was away, I was able to kind of, remove myself completely from it kind of and just focus on other things till the right time happened because it wasn't a should I make it for this tournament it was a let's consider this option when I'm ready which is kind of a whole different uh, question you start asking yourself or a whole different mindset compared to like how it normally is because most injuries you know I had hip surgery which is not a small thing in 2011 I got back from that in eight weeks um like it's quite different this time around obviously I'm not back then I was 20 years old um that's not the case anymore even though daily I probably wish I was um but that was kind of the first step then the second step is you start getting back into it or you start wanting to even the idea of getting back into it and you just kind of I don't know what the magical number is, and I've had many conversations about this, but there's, if I was to take two months off tennis, I could probably get myself back to where I want to be in terms of like feeling the ball and feeling good about things pretty quickly. But there's some point that I kind of passed and you feel like, it's not like you lose it gradually. It's kind of feels like you just fall off a cliff at one point. I don't know if that was for me yet two months, three months, four, eight, whatever point that was at. So the way back was kind of much longer. And that's why it took me so long. And a lot of it was, I healed up my Achilles thing as best as I could managing it. You know, it, you know, doesn't feel 
perfect all the time by any means. And um, especially being on a court and jumping around and stuff and day in, day out. But um, I knew that I could kind of push myself a bit more to see, but then other things came up. Um, you know, your knees start to feel it, your hips start to feel it. It's two years of not doing a constant thing you've trained and doing, and that you need to do not only many times over, but at a much higher speed with much more force. And then other parts start, and then you have more smaller setbacks. And since urgency is not on your side, you kind of try to deal with them more diligently and more, let's say, with more patience, just to make sure that those things aren't coming back up again. And then that got me to the point where um, if I wanted to come back on court, it wasn't really appropriate for... Um, the Australian Open at the beginning of this year, um, just before, towards the end of last year, I got hurt again. And then I got uh, COVID actually for the first time, which quite late in that whole cycle. And then uh, the question became on, um, would I want to come back for two, two week events in March that, you know, not knowing what my level is, you could be on the road for a month and maybe only play two matches. Indian and Wells I knew Clay was in Indian Wells in Miami, exactly. And then um, knowing I probably wouldn't want to play on clay after that, considering that I've had issues with my knee and hip on that before. I didn't want to irritate it, and also how close it would back up to. So I said, okay, once I miss that first part of the year, the most logical thing to have some continuity, to have kind of the best, as best as a situation could be, to be able to play continuously and so forth, it really was at the start of grass. I'll ask you another real quick one here before Ben hops in. And that's just what was the easiest and hardest part of your tennis game to get back when you did step onto the court and start to try and find that rhythm again? Like, like, is that serve always there for you? Can you get out of bed in the morning after months and just start dropping bombs on the court? Or or is that a tougher one for you to, to reestablish your, your big weapon there? Yeah, for me, just the tennis kind of came relatively easy. I thought it was going to be hard for me. It was harder more to find like the movement and kind of the rhythm of things. But if I was standing in one corner, hitting cross court forehands, cross court backhands, those kind of things I felt really good about. Um, the serving for me actually was quite easy when it came a day to day thing, but I, I just had to kind of build up being able to serve for longer periods of amount because a lot of you, once you step away, you really, have an appreciation for how few things you do with your arms overhead and getting like your shoulder kind of like flowing properly and like swinging overhead that kind of took like we have to do a lot of prehab exercises to kind of really get going on that side to make sure that all those mechanical things are okay that I know I could go certain because I really struck it's kind of a crazy thing to say but I really struggle if somebody was telling me surf slowly I don't doubt it. It's such a biomechanical movement, right? With the knee, with the power coming from the legs all the way up, I lose that rhythm completely. So for me, like when I warm up serves, when things are going well, like I will probably the first serve you hit is around a hundred miles an hour because then every, it just, the synergy of everything is just kind of flowing and that power kind of comes. But if you were to tell me like, Hey, try serving 70 miles an hour, I would really struggle, definitely not be able to place it anywhere, but I, I think I would even struggle like consistently putting it in the box because I'm used to kind of everything working together and that kind of produces a certain speed, but you don't necessarily want to put that right away on your shoulder. So you have to kind of take two steps back to go to, uh, to make two, three, four steps forward. But, you know, I was able, the nice thing was like, that was also very motivating. I was able to hit my spots pretty quickly. Like, it made it settled that aspect of it like okay this is going to be a thing about me figuring out the movement and the physical side of things rather than having to like really struggle and also figure out the tennis side of things on top of it you uh you really went in in detail on you know certain injuries with the achilles and setbacks and i wonder during this process and time away did did you ever consult with any other players who maybe stepped away from the game for a long period of time and went back did you have any of those conversations with other atp players or even women's players about uh, that process when you were sort of working your way back towards the tour 
Yes, uh, like it would be more in happenstance if in passing, like uh, um, Thomas Johansson kind of came back, uh, saw, ran into him, and he was kind of talking to to me, and he actually mentioned more in depth to my coach how I believe when Magnus Norman came back from his hip surgery, um, how he tried to come back right away playing the bigger events, and then he ended up having to take a step back and go to like the challenger tours to kind of build things up and so forth. Um, and then the, in another way, another good thing that you could learn from is there's been a, quite a few players that have been making some kind of comebacks as of recently with Dominic kind of being one big one post his U S open victory with the wrist thing. Um, Wawrinka also making his way back, Andy Murray, he's been making his way back for a longer period of time. So you can see how other players did things. And you kind of tried to learn from it. But the one thing that kind of kept me very positive and somewhat eager about things was that I wasn't like foreign to like many weak returns, right? Two years is a whole different thing. And I don't believe that anybody was kind of away for two years like I was um, of the guys I mentioned. But I had done many times like six weeks away, eight weeks away, 12, like these kind of things that... I was just, I knew what I had to focus on. I was just hoping it would work out. You know, I knew that I can't go to the first tournament and not serve well. Like that's, if I'd been playing for six months in a row and I'm not serving well, that's already trouble. So if I'm not away from tennis for so long and I come back not serving well, um, that would have, you know, it would have been probably also very demotivating because then the whole thing like puts you so many steps back because beauty of things for me or at least the thing that I've always been able I know what my weapons are it's very clear it's very clear what I need to do a lot of my results will depend on if I can execute my things well I'm not the kind of player that's um, waiting to see too much what the other player gives to me and then kind of being reactive it's about me creating and taking my game to the other guy and either I can do that or not and I'm pretty harsh and honest with myself like I could see Am I, is this within grasp or not? And then, you know, some days things seem great. Some days things seem awful and you're like, oh my, what am I going through? Like, why is this, like, this is not, like, there were certain days where it's like, oh, I'm not like a level away. I feel like I'm like 10 levels away. Mm -hmm. And, but the thing is, it's just, it's just like tennis throughout a career, throughout a year. There's many ups and downs. You kind of deal with it. It just, when you don't have that recent memory or that those recent beliefs, it feels a little bit further away and you just got to kind of calm yourself and reset them, uh, give yourself a chance and try to stay as positive as you can, which can be sometimes one of the harder things for me to do. I think for a lot of Canadian fans, we were struck by the the memories of that you produced uh, in years past at Wimbledon when we had the chance to see you again at the All England Club this year for the first time in four years. Just what what did it mean for you to walk back on the grounds, have the opportunity to play there again? And I, I feel like the last time we spoke with you, you've uh, described it as your your favorite tournament on the calendar. Yeah, it's that kind of makes all those difficult moments, all those like moments of doubt all worth it um i don't I, I guess in some ways like one thing i wish i was better at was enjoying my time when i'm at places but i get very much caught up in what do i need to do now and what's like the best decision i can make to be as ready as possible and you kind of get in this whole cycle and you never like stop for a moment to really enjoy something and and i think one thing that probably in disguise was um a good thing where it kind of kept emotions at bay and let me really focus on the tennis was Wimbledon looks very different than it did four years ago. You don't enter in the same place. Like some of the stuff is the same. The locker room is the same, but the locker room, I only, I think the first, the, the first year they did th that new locker room was in 2019. So I really only experienced it for one year before the locker room that I knew was quite different, but um, a lot of things were different. So I think that was actually kind of a cool thing for me because rather than it being so nostalgic and so emotion inducing, it kind of felt like a reset, like, okay, I know what this means and I know how important it is to me, but you're kind of looking around at 
oh, this is new, this is new, rather than like, oh, remember when this happened here, remember when this happened here. And it kind of let me just really focus on the tennis aspect of things rather than like the question of like, oh, I remember I did so well here last time I played. I hope I can do that again. And it just really kept things in a very short term perspective and in the moment. For us watching you, it seemed just so natural to see you back at Wimbledon as you know we watched on TV and tennis fans watched on TV as well. Before Wimbledon, you played a tune-up event at, uh, let's see, Ben, if I pronounce this right, uh, Hertogenbosch. And yeah, pretty good. Thank but you. But there's a little S in front of there that yeah, I, I can't spell it. Don't ask me to... if you have if you have to pronounce that or not. I can pronounce it now. I still can't spell it. But but at any rate, what was your mindset like when you were about to step out there for that first match at Hertogenbosch against Miramir Kikmanovic? You haven't played in nearly two years. What's going through your mind before you step on court? And how the heck did you feel after getting that that win in straight sets? Yeah, it was a lot of things. Um I remember, like, the last thing I wanted to do was kind of go out there flat. I knew I was going to be nervous. I, that was I could even feel it, like, waiting uh, kind of in the locker room or the players area to go on court. But I didn't want to, like, go out there flat because I knew that was kind of a recipe where it can, you know, if you come out with too much energy, you can always kind of dial it back. But if you don't come out with enough, um, it's really hard to, like, get going, especially if you're nervous, right? It's uh, It's hard to it can become very daunting to get things, especially for my person. It might be different for other people that way. But I was inc incredibly nervous before. I, came. I think I had six double faults in the first two games. Um, and once I was able to kind of, the thing I, I just really, it's kind of crazy to say, but I just didn't want to suck. Right? Not, you kind not of crazy. It makes through, total sense. You kind of go, like, actually, which probably helped is I practiced with him a couple of days before he was my first practice at Hertog and Bosch. Um, so um, I practiced with him a couple of days before. Maybe that gave me a sense of like, okay, I belong. Like I still have it within me, but you still didn't like, I've been, a. have always actually played my best tournaments when I've lost every single set in practice. Um, so you're kind of wondering like, okay, I'm doing well in these sets. I'm like, and then you're kind of like, wait, if I look back at things, I've kind of always haven't played necessarily my best when I've done well in these sets. So you're kind of like fighting so many things, but the craziest thing to me that coming up, I forgot how to do everything. I forgot how many bottles I take out on court. I, I remember even for stringing, I was like, how many rackets would I take out for a two out of three set match? Um, these kind of like things that were so innate and just natural you really forget those things um what do i need to have on the court with me what do i remember that being like how do i get ready how much earlier before a match do i like to warm up like all these kind of things everything was so new and you're just kind of like guessing and you're kind of like this worked for me before right is that kind of how it used to be and i'm a person that's always been like very routine like i try to repeat the same thing as much as possible um whether it be just out of, I guess it's superstition ultimately, but it's just, if I do the small things right, I have the best chance to kind of do the big thing right, was the way I always saw it. And going back and forth with that stuff was kind of exhausting and tiring because everything is a doubt. I'm like, is this what I used to do? Did I pack enough matches, uh, shirts for this match? Uh, when it's around this temperature, how much do I need? Do I still sweat a lot? Like, <laughs> I've been playing in one place. I spent most of the time while I was hurt in the Bahamas. So I'm practicing in one place. I know one type of weather. Um, this is all, like, we're talking about then a whole different surface, whole different balls, like, all that kind of stuff. was so foreign. But the best feeling, I have to say, was it was joy to be on the court, but it was kind of a relief. Uh, as well after winning that match because you just don't know how things are going to look when you step in you're like okay I still have some of this kind of in me and I still can kind of find a way to get it out and it was a relief because you wanted to believe that so many times but you know when it's time to really do it you don't know if you're going to and that was kind of the biggest emotion I was able to I was able to just kind of relax a little bit I was a bit kind of hyped up as well but um, I was able to kind of just like let my guard down about the other things. And then 
it was a big difference how nervous I was before the first compared to the second. Like I was nervous for the second match because you're like, okay, now can I back it up? Um, but it's a whole different thing of can I back it up compared to can I even do this at all? I think that's funny about your routine and, and that being the toughest part to remember. It's stressing me out. I, thinking of- I, I remember. So I've had the same stringers for Grand Slams for, I, don't, I believe we started in 2013. They had to tell me how many rackets I normally took <laughs> when it came to like uh, playing three out of five sets. How They're many like, is that? Oh, this is what you use. Uh, 11 rackets. Yeah. Wow. Because nine rackets, I think nine or eight rackets gets you to like, if every set goes to tie break and eight all. But then, mind you, I forgot that I thought I still thought for some reason that the Wimbledon fi- like final set was at twelve all a tie break right. because that's how I remember that Roger and Rafa match. Um, but then I saw many. Okay, luckily it wasn't me that was going to those points. But I saw in many matches the tiebreaker was at six all. Um, but I was kind of so I was like nine rackets because that gets me past that eight all if you're changing every seven and nine uh, uh, ball change. I can't, I can't remember how many, I only have two rackets. I, I'm stressing out for Rafa now when he comes back next year. If you struggle with your routine, how's he going to get back to his routine with all of his little <laughs> But I feel ports? like he doesn't forget his routine ever. Probably does it at home in the I morning. I feel like he'll, he's not playing. he'll go tomorrow if he's practicing, if he's on court, and he'll still put his water bottles a specific way. Oh, yeah. You know, I really got away from it. <laughs> like, I really, <laughs> like, if my bottles were upright during my practices, that was a good start. <laughs> then you go i had two questions and one there i feel like yeah no i i have to ask i mean we heard a little bit about uh your trance i think of your physical transformation just returning to the tour uh losing weight and it looks like you were in, in such great shape when you got back on court and were playing again what was that process like and what were some of the biggest changes maybe you had to make whether dietary or in terms of workout to to feel like you were at your physical peak again yeah, um, I think for me, the biggest thing was, it was about, like I said, I couldn't do the basic things when it came to like putting much pressure on my feet, like just even bouncing. So I couldn't do any kind of running. Yeah, I could do biking, but I've always had issues post hip surgery. Like, what is that now? 12 years ago, biking is not really an ideal thing for me. I'm a tall guy, I kind of hunch over other things start to hurt. So all of a sudden for a year and a half, cardio was kind of non-existent for me just because there were so limited ways I could do I could do some swimming but swimming doesn't really always convert to tennis because you're kind of creating force out of a completely different part of your body than you normally are um so I ended up just doing a lot of strength because I really struggled not doing something physical every day because um and then I kind of just got bigger and heavier and as soon as uh, the conversation was like, okay, what would me coming back look like? It would be, hey, most of your injuries have been lower body. You got to take some stress off your joints. And I, I think at one point I lost something uh, a bit over 40 pounds. And um, and I did it quickly. I was trying for a long time to do it slowly, to do some changes kind of with diet, that kind of thing. I really was struggling that way. and. I didn't want that to be what held me back. So I actually lost most of it in about six weeks. And it's, I would not recommend that. I was just kind of eating a steak a day and kind of just putting myself through that. Like, Hey, if I lose muscle at this moment, which for me has never been an issue to kind of put back on. I just said for the health of my joints and to have the best chance possible, I need to get this number down. And that was kind of the way I did it. No recommendation to anybody for it. It's not a fun way to do it. It's not, there's so many kind of, things that are unpleasant about it but I kind of got to the point like where it was kind of uh, an urgency of how do I do this because I really want to give myself a chance and it was yeah it's kind of the point I got to and then after that we um, when it came to training we kind of I've always, like I've said, stuck to routine. I don't want to give up a lot of the things that I know worked for me before, even though sometimes you might say like, hey, this could have been what was causing the issues for you. But also at the same time, I was pretty successful doing those things as well when I could be on court. So I think it was just about finding a balance. But one thing we did um, um, more and more of is like, 
we tried to just lessen impact on joints when it was possible. And then the buildup we did over a much, like this wasn't a six or four week off season that we were doing. It was like a 12 week thing that we did kind of as the ultimate push before I got close to playing on grass. Um, so even though it wasn't the most fun sometimes, cause I always like to compete when I train and I make games out of things, we really had to go like, Hey, let's start slow. Like for the first week when you're playing, you know, you're doing consecutive days. Now let's not go more than, 45 minutes or an hour. And it should just feel like a long warm up on court, like you would do for a match. You know, that's fun for day one, day two, because it's new. But like day five, day six, where you're like, hey, I've kind of been only doing warm ups the last few days, it can kind of get a little bit to you because you kind of want to progress. You kind of want to believe that you can make those steps forward, but you just kind of need to have somebody there around to kind of hold you back to be like, hey, let's not rush this. Like, time's on our side. Let's do it right. Well, I, I commend you for for that commitment uh, and your transformation. It's been incredible. I, I have to ask, I mean, we're a couple weeks away from the National Bank Open in Toronto. What are your expectations maybe just getting back there, playing in Canada in front of fans again, and, and maybe in terms of what you can do on court? Yeah. Um, I think the expectations on court i think that's kind of the easiest thing to because there are really none there's really no like recent reference point i know i can play tennis well well you know i wish that i had complete control if the timing on the way i'm playing at that moment will continue i even this um kind of start on grass was a little up and down i started well in her talking about got hurt right away had to skip queens kind of played um Wimbledon holding things together um and then you know now I'm good I'm able to train but it's hard to know like when things will kind of click for me or if I will be able to play my best but I know that I have it within myself which is a good feeling it gives me a lot of uh a lot of calm about it um but the most exciting thing for me is coming back to Toronto Toronto has been five years since I played um it's been four since I played in Canada at all in Montreal. Um, but five years since I played in Toronto, that's, you know, it's kind of crazy because it's about 10 minutes away from where I grew up in Thornhill. Um, so, and personally for me, playing in front of uh, Canadian fans will be great. But for me, one of, like on a deeper personal note, like during the time I was hurt, there was a lot of COVID stipulations and people couldn't come to match. Um, my parents haven't come to been able to come to a match of mine since um, I believe that would kind of mount up to like 2019 at some point because they wow. didn't go at 2020 to uh, Australia. There was only the few events at the beginning of the year before everything was kind of shut down. And then after that, it, nothing was possible till I got hurt. That one will probably be the most meaningful to me because as many people know, like you could always see my mom and my dad around and those were the people that were kind of around always since the beginning, taking me to tennis and just dropping me off, watching me play OTA events, you know, all over, all over uh, Ontario through can like when nobody else was there kind of watching. So that will also be a very dear part and meaningful part to me as well. It's going to be kind of emotional over here, here in this, uh, this kind of stuff here, but yeah, totally, hopefully I'm not totally I'm relatable, not, yeah. you know, emotion, emotional, emotional, uh, um disconnection is kind of a strength of mine <laughs> I hear you. well you kind of have to i'm sure in your field of uh of work as well and uh you know as we wrap things up here our last couple of minutes i'm gonna ask the only tough question i think i kind of have here and and i don't know if you have an answer or not and that's fair obviously but you know is the national bank open going to be your last tournament or are you hoping that your body is going to allow you to to keep going with this no i i Playing in Toronto for the national, it will not be my last tournament. I, uh, that's the thing for me that gets emotional about it is, um, after going through everything, you have such a shorter, um, perspective because you don't think everything is just going to be fine kind of all the way through. Um, the thing for me, that's probably the most emotional part about it is if things can somehow work out and, um, be good. It's not like, the Toronto event comes up next year, right? It comes up in two years, right? It's different from a lot of other events that come up annually. 
um, the National Bank Open comes up, but you go to another city to play. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's one of the bigger things why it's a bit because if you if you talk to me about like, what's your summer going to look like, I'm going to play in Toronto, I'm going to play Cincinnati, I'm going to play the US Open. Awesome. But if somebody asks you like, what's your next summer going to look like? I can tell you what I'd like it to look like. Yeah. But if somebody tells you like, what's summer probably going to look like for you two years away from now? I won't even bother to have an assumption on what it would. So I think that's the more um, emotional aspect of that that part and the connection to Toronto for me. Well, that's encouraging. I'll, I'll, I'm glad glad to hear that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll get in a, a couple fan questions as we wrap up. Um, at Vandis Land Puck on Twitter asks, do you plan to stay in the game after retirement, either coaching, commentary, any other avenue, or have you thought that far at all? I would imagine after having this kind of year plus where before I started being able to train and kind of get fully back into it, the most immediate thing for me, once the professional playing is kind of behind, I think we'll probably be a little bit removed from tennis. Um, one thing I've kind of learned is um, I want to take time to learn some new skills. You know, I, I've really focused on that tennis skill for a very long time. And I think if I really miss tennis and um, I want to come back, that will always be a very exciting thing that I can. But I wouldn't want to end up sticking around tennis because I didn't take the time to learn something else. And then you can, I don't know if you can enjoy tennis as much if you're there because you have to be rather than because you want to be. Some great answers. And, uh, you know, we got a bunch of listener questions, but I think, Ben, you and I worked them into our questions as well because we were mm -hmm. kind of on the same page as our listeners. Um, Milos, I really hope we get a chance to, to speak with you again, hopefully during the National Bank Open, because this is just sort of like teasing us with uh, with having you back. And it's been great to to speak with you again. And look, I just want to say, uh, you know, regardless of what happens down the road, whether you make it to 47 like Daniel Nestor or not, um, you know, Tennis Canada and, and Canadian tennis fans owe you, you owe you a big thank you for uh, everything you've done for the sport, how far you've taken uh, the sport of tennis in our country. And whenever you do decide to leave tennis professionally, you've left it in a much stronger place than where you found it, that's for sure. So we thank you for your time. We thank you for that. And it's really great to see you back out there. Back out there. Thank you. I appreciate it. And for me, it's really nice, you know, now that the wild cards have kind of you're, there's going to be six Canadians on the men's side in the main draw. Um, myself and, you know, three well-deserving players that were part of that winning Davis Cup team, uh, earning wild cards as well. Um, so that's all exciting. And that's a very big change, you know, from when I first came out. And I'm sure Daniel Nestor, as an example, would say it's very different. It was the first time he came out. So all these kind of things, they're little things that kind of happen on the side, but very endearing to see and very special to be a part of.